The next two speakers uh, also tap into another theme uh, of the conference, which is uh, people who don't fit in neat little boxes. Um, Roberto Regabon is my professor and a macroeconomist who will tell you that a lot of macroeconomy and macroeconomists are full of crap. And if you take his class, you will be struck immediately by how independent he is in his thinking and how unswayed he is by, by the masses. He's very impressive. I'm, I'm so glad that you get to, uh, to meet him here today. Uh, Jennifer Hanley was able to join us uh, today. It's a change in the program. She's from the same uh, uh, firm, uh, Tusk Ventures. She's another person who doesn't fit in a box. Uh, she actually was a former secretary, uh, press secretary uh, for uh, Hillary Clinton and is now uh, working in venture capital as a managing director uh, of the in the Boston office here for Tusk Ventures. So please welcome Jennifer and Roberto. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, let me start kicking off this uh, first. Thank Very you so much. Very deep uh, couch. Yeah, this is. Um, yeah, we design things, but not necessarily they are good. Uh, first, thank you so much for coming uh, to MIT, taking time of your busy agenda and traveling across uh, the U.S. Uh, with this weather. It's great that you are yeah, here. So thank you so much for home. that. On behalf of MIT, I want to. Thank all the speakers and all the organizers uh, for setting up this conference. It's a, it's a great success. I, I, I see a lot of my students here, so I think they might be skipping my 10 a.m. class. <laughs> uh, for that, you know, you, you have a penalty, so you have to do another problem set. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, <clears throat> let, me, let me kick off this uh, by telling you a little bit about uh, my opinion about what has happened politically. Uh, I think this is the first time I have ever been invited to a venture capitalist uh, meeting. I mean, I'm a, I am a macroeconomist, so venture capitalists, they, they really don't care what I have to say, uh, which is, is okay. I, I don't take it personally, don't worry. Uh, I really don't want to know what you have to say either. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but, but, well, we're off to a great start. Yeah. <laughs> but, but the fact that you have invited a macroeconomist is, is actually quite meaningful. I actually think that the world, uh, uh, that developed nations, we took always macroeconomic stability for granted. And, and in fact, for many, many decades, that, that was true. I think that after World War II, most uh, developed nations had a very stable market economy. The economies that were a disaster were my countries. Like, uh, you know, I was born in Venezuela, my dad was Argentinian, you know, so I, I'm a complete biological disaster. Uh, so, uh, so we were the places where, where disasters took place. We were the places where macroeconomic instability uh, was damaging. And in fact, uh, it is the case that macroeconomic instability has a first order impact on standards of living. Uh, I think that this has changed uh, since the, uh, the beginning of this century. Uh, developed nations stopped growing. And, um, and that had an impact not only on, uh, on our standards of living, how fast we were improving, but more importantly, that had an impact on our politics and our society. Uh, problems that existed before, we didn't realize they existed, like income inequality, uh, inequality of opportunities. And the reason why we didn't notice is because if everybody's improving, it's hard to notice that one is going faster than the other. It's when you stop, it's when you are in that moment of stopping that you realize that things are not exactly the way you thought they were. And, uh, and that has a very important impact all over the world. I think that actually emerging markets are moving out of populism. Uh, uh, and you can see that in Latin America, all the countries, well, I am from Venezuela, I'm the most pathetic one, so it will take a long time for me to, uh, to move my country out of populism, but, but Brazil is moving out, uh, Argentina is moving out, uh, Chile has moved out, uh, Colombia, uh, and so on, Mexico. So all of them went through the process of uh, 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 where their politics was affected by their economic outcomes, they got disappointed, they understood what needed to be done, and they are moving back uh, toward more conservative, more pragmatic policies. Uh, this is just starting for developed nations. And, uh, and, and, uh, and I want to have two messages. One is about patience, and the other one is about hope. I don't want to end this, uh, my 
10 minutes with a depressing uh, uh, conversation. Um, it will be depressing though, but, <laughs> but I want to, uh, in, in some sense, uh, tell you a little bit where this is going. I have seen this played out many, many times. And, and these processes are not short. They are not short. This doesn't take six months, never. Not here, nor ever. These are always long. Societies need to learn that they made a mistake. And that takes a while. And we individuals do not learn from the experience of others. Can you imagine 330 million trying to collectively learn? It takes a while. And therefore, we need to test. We need to test as a society, and I think it's healthy that we test the populism from the right and the populism from the left. We need both. So we understand as a society what is the path that we have to follow. That we are able to construct a vision of what country we want to build, not the things we want to destroy. Most of our politics, not only in the US, in all developed nations, is a list of things that they want to destroy. That's all that they tell you. I mean, in, in, in Finland, the same as here, that as in the UK, we're just blaming foreigners. In the south of developed nations, I mean, it is with Italy, Spain, Greece, and France, they are blaming sectors. Uh, nobody's telling us what type of society they want to build. And, and, and in fact, the very few that tell us, uh, they don't resonate with the voters. Because voters don't care about that right now. They care about an easy solution. They care about an easy way out. We are in traffic, they just tell me where I have to turn. As opposed to saying, well, we have to be patient, we have to work harder, we have to educate ourselves, we have to be more uh, understanding, more accepting. Uh, those are very difficult things. I, we need to increase taxes, please vote for me. Uh, I, will get, I will not even get the four votes and I have four members in my immediate family <laughs> that vote all of them, those bastards. I have two Republicans among them. <laughs> but, so, but the, 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 point, the point is, this takes long. Is that okay? Now, the optimistic thing is that the US is not Venezuela. That I, 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 I understand that some of you have tremendous fear. I actually had conversation with many of you uh, right after the elections because I, it's very understandable that there are fears among a lot of individuals whose values, in some sense, are being challenged by, uh, by the Trump administration. And, and by the way, I want, to, I want to be very clear. I am usually Republican. I am very fiscally responsible. Very, very, that doesn't mean that I agree with the Muslim bans, but, but I am usually very Republican. And I think that there are many, many things that need to be questioned in the United States that we do it better. So I do think that there are aspects that need to be uh, challenged. But I think that after a, a November's election, uh, fear was dominating most of the discourse. And, um, and I remember saying, uh, well, this is not Venezuela. And what differentiates the US, or any developed nation for that matter, uh, to emerging markets is the quality of the institutions. I thought it was fantastic that Janet Yellen, immediately after the election, she said, you know what? I'm staying here, baby. You might want, you want, <laughs> might want to kick me out, but I am finishing my term. What a beautiful F you. Is that okay? That is a fantastic statement. And you can do nothing. I think that what happened yesterday in the court is another example of how institutions will protect um, this. The same happened in the UK. When Theresa May wanted to negotiate Brexit their way, the court said, no, this has to be a public discussion. This is not a dictatorship. This doesn't happen in these nations. Even Italy, we elected in Italy Berlusconi. I'm an Italian family. We elected Berlusconi. And Berlusconi had an impact in the economy, but it was tailored, it was tampered by the quality of the institutions. I'm not saying this is going to be booming. And I'm not saying this is not going to be uncertain. There will be macroeconomic uncertainty. There will be macroeconomic instability. But the message is that trust your institutions and work on the quality of institutions. Work on making them stronger, because that is the protection from the craziness. That is what you're going to isolate. Doesn't matter what is said in that Oval Office, you will be protected. Because institutions will guarantee that there will be a representation of minorities and there will be protection. So. Um, and I guess I would just add to that in terms of oh, this audience. Um, I was going to end, though. I, no, no, no. <laughs> no, no, well, because just to, because I, 
I, th I think what you're saying is very interesting and certainly right on the mark for how a lot of people in this room probably feel. And it's always good to get another person's perspective who has such a macro viewpoint. Um, but as far as it's a marathon, right? We're not, we really have, we have four years of this. Some people like to cut it up into we have a midterm, we have a great opportunity, depending on where your politics fall, that the Democrats have a great opportunity to sort of pr create more balance on the legislative front. But for the folks in this room who are either contemplating um, a startup or, or is full on in the midst of running one, or those who are investing in them, there are opportunities to really look at where can my voice make a difference? And how can I become more engaged in a way that's meaningful? It do, you don't have to boil the ocean on this, right? Like you don't have to get involved in every single issue because there are going to be so many. I mean, what are we in like day 20? And I mean, I'm my head spinning. And so, we have 20 issues. Right. Yes. <laughs> so um, what I have found so encouraging um, is the way that people have become engaged, the way tech companies have stepped up, the, the leadership has stepped up. Do they, again, do they have to step up into everything? No. But they have to pick their lanes and really go after the things where they can have make a difference. And it's really important, probably more so than ever. Um, so for all the sort of turmoil and the, and the change, there's also, like you said, keeping focused on the, on the hope that exists within this little whirlwind that we're, that we're in. Yes, yeah, so, so one, 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 one way you are saying this is that I, I, I tend never to use the word involved. I, I, I don't like involved. I like the word commitment. And it's, um, I think that the US is demanding more commitment, less involvement. Involvement is what you do when you actually are not committed. I mean, I am not involved with my wife. I am committed to her. <laughs> uh, I, I, I am not involved with the, my kids. I am committed to them. Truly, I am not involved with you. I'm not involved with MIT. I'm, I'm committed to it. I, I, you know, I have a broken arm and I come here. And, uh, and it, this is very painful. Now, your questions are more painful than a broken arm. I, I can tell you that. But, <laughs> but, 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 but in some sense, you're right. I, I, actually, I didn't think about it that way. But, but what you are saying is that the, today, you have to forget about involvement. You need to commit. It's impossible to commit to every single cause on earth. Impossible. So pick the one that is important for you and advocate and protect and demand proper behavior from the people that is near you. I think it starts a lot with that. I mean, like the previous presentation is a lot about commitment. Mm -hmm. It's asking. I, I, think I agree. So. I think Kat really set the stage for just the pillars of how you, how you think about this and ending with, with justice and doing what's right. Um, and, and look, it's right for what's good for your business, too. I mean, it's, it's not, I mean, I think I probably can speak pretty broadly. We all care, I mean, very, very deeply about the civil liberty issues that are on the table right now and being talked about. And they, they really hit at the core of what this country um, is all about. Um, and what I think some of us would you know, fight to the death for. But, um, but there are also the economics that are in play that are not getting the coverage, like the trade implications that um, are really, the, the media is not covering in the way that I think that it, it should because the implications are significant, um, but they're complex. They're not good you know, baked bean headlines, as I say, you know, the, the, we are just in like Twitter land right now. So you can't tweet about trade in a way that anyone can fully comprehend um, the consequences. So the civil liberties issues are e extremely important, but we just can't also lose sight of the things that have the implications for the startups that we are focused on or investing in. Um, so, you know, I just think it's, they, they all kind of go, to, they, these things go together um, and, and need to. Yeah, so, so, um... Yeah, trade and environment are two areas that I'm, 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 I'm concerned. Because uh, if you go back a little bit to what I said before, uh, those are the institutional protection on those two areas is mm -hmm. relatively weak. It's true. And the uh, engagement in them, right? Oh, I mean, if you, if you think about your sort of stereotypical environmentalist, um, 
you know, you think Greenpeace, and like you think of someone like chained to a tree, um, and that's not what we're talking about at all. Aren't they all chained to a tree? <laughs> <laughs> right. So it's it's not that. It's, yeah, no, it's, it's rational, not that. Yeah. Uh, reasonable environmental policies. Yeah, that I, believe I, in science. I mean, if anyone can appreciate that, it's the people in, oh. in, in, in this room or who you know, are actively engaged in this institution or committed to this institution. Yeah. Yes, yes, and, it's a, and when you think about it, uh, because there's not an organized uh, defense, mm -hmm. is uh, undefensible. It's true. It, it's a, so, yeah, so the environment uh, is a place where I think uh, we, we might see... Um, very negative impact uh, in this uh, in and, these years to come, and it yeah. concerns me because I think that we all have to be have a voice, and I think we've shown that in this country that there will be loud, strong opposition to a lot of the civil liberties oriented policies that that this administration is is pushing. But I I do worry that in this you know land of tweeting that the that some of the other economic implications are going to get lost because you can't you can't put them on a on a billboard necessarily um, yeah. so i do hope that as part as this starts to unfold over the next several months and and we're in this for years it looks like that that those issues get the get the attention you know that they deserve can you tell us a little bit uh from the inside uh, circle of Hillary, how this uh, evolved, if you can share some of that with us? What, like how we got into this mess? <laughs> <laughs> well, and I, I don't mean to imply that everyone in this room is a Hillary supporter or obviously, you know, or an anti-Trump person. So when you ask, do you mean um, my thoughts on the election itself or? Well, so, so did you see any of these coming? Did you uh, feel, did, would you have changed something in the in I, you know, we, my, myself and my family were really involved in this election personally and in our free, so you were in, our, in our free time. Um, so I was committed, yes. I was in, committed in like going door to door with my, my children and my husband was doing things that like he didn't, would rather eat dirt than call voters. Like it's just, he's not that kind of a person. Uh, but he was on the phone and we, you know, we all, we did like the things that we, that we had the time and ability to do. Um, but was I, I, I was very concerned. I mean, look, if you look back on the 04 um, election, there were a lot of us who thought that Kerry was going to win. And when you really looked at the analysis of that race and why he didn't, there were so many um, socioeconomic divides. And I, I said very openly and publicly to, to friends and colleagues that I was extremely concerned that we weren't, that the polls were wrong. And that, um, and that there was a greater, greater divide than, than people realize. And I think, you know, I'm sort of a, a genetic mess, if you will. Like, I, my father's from uh, Texas, grew up in a Baptist family. I would go and visit him often. My parents divorced. My mother's like a Bernie Sanders um, immigrant from Germany who like believes that all things, I mean, she's horrified. This is literally, this is, this represents everything that her family worked hard to get away from and to change when they were living and growing up in Germany. So, so um, the fact of the matter is that like I come from these very different places. Um, so I think I just happen to have like a pragmatic view of some of this. And um, not that people came here to hear all about like my thoughts on this election per se, but what I what even in the like days before when we were going to different cities, I felt reflected on if this doesn't come out the way that we hope it will, the one the one element of this, the only thing that I felt in my gut, as some of my dearest, closest Hillary supporter friends sat at home and like did their day to day and didn't hit the streets in different parts of the world. I mean, or country, the different parts of the country, I couldn't help but reflect on like, it's just, we don't, it's not enough. And people think that just showing up, to your point, yeah. is going to be enough. And my, my hope then, and I, and I see it playing out now, we all do, but I really, like, this is not a, it, it, this is not a, a sport that you just observe. This is participatory. And you do have to commit to it because it's our government. And you know, it just comes back to 
you know, when Kat was saying how lucky she feels to be part of a, an industry, this is, a, the, the people in this room have an opportunity to be engaged in ways that really exceed um, anything anywhere else. And, and it is exciting, and I think that's what p the folks who walk you know, away from today have to remember, that when I, the, the political cir circumstances that we're living in are what they are, but all of this hopefully means people are more committed and engaged and really actively doing things and looking for ways, whether it's through businesses that will help change lives, fill some of the voids that are going, we're going to see because government spending gets pulled back in some areas, services deteriorate, um, whether it's helping to shed light on the, the, the uniqueness and beauty of immigration and the things we care about. I mean, there's just kind of a limitless um, opportunities that I think we have to focus on from, a, from the hope perspective. In fact, uh, my, my wife blames me uh, for, 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 for everything that has happened in the United States, actually. Yeah, that's, that's, <laughs> that uh, men are usually to blame. Yes, no, it's, uh, <laughs> uh, because my grandfather had to escape Italy when Mussolini was there. My mother has to escape uh, Spain when uh, uh, Franco took over. As, uh, then uh, my grandfather moved to Italy and my father was born in, in, in Argentina. And then uh, my father had to leave when Perón was elected. Uh, then he moved to Venezuela. So they both met in Venezuela. And then both moved out of Venezuela when Chavez uh, was elected. <laughs> and, and, and I became a US citizen uh, in the year where September 11 took place. So, so according to my wife, it is a curse of the Rigo bonds. Uh, so, so you should try to keep me out as soon yeah. as possible, <laughs> just to let you know. So maybe so we there's. Know who to blame. Yeah, maybe, now you curse. know who to blame. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, uh, let me, let me, you, you brought uh, economics and trade, and, and I think that, um, uh, let me also put a, a, a positive spin uh, on that. I, I think um, um, on, on aspect of trade, uh, le, let me tell you what happens in practice. The worst that can happen is what we call quantity restrictions. Is when you, for example, you stop trading with a country. This is what, in fact, we do this all the time. We put sanctions. So if, if we have a problem with Iran, we put sanctions right. to Iran. We have a problem with Cuba, we put sanctions to Cuba. And sanctions is the prohibition of trade. Uh, we don't put tariffs. We don't put 10% tariffs, or 20% tariffs, or 50% tariffs for that matter. And the reason is that actually in practice, there is a very different impact in the society when you put tariffs versus when you put prohibitions. Prohibitions are very costly. Uh, but if we increase the tariff with, with uh, um, uh, Mexico by 10%, mm -hmm. that would be bad. But to be honest, the economic impact is tiny. Right. We, in this building, we have spent a century trying to find the negative impact because we know it exists. Okay? And when we find one, we, it's a major publication. And I think we have had in the history like two or three times. Uh, but they are tiny. Uh, and the reason is because companies, individuals, and countries adapt to those price changes. Uh, I always give the example uh, of how we deal with addiction in human beings. So if I smoke, well, one way is that you put me a tax. And you say, well, I'm going to charge you $1 every time you smoke. Well, can you think about uh, if someone is alcoholic, how much you will need to charge on those taxes for the person to stop drinking? What about if you like food, like me? I like to eat a lot. I cannot stop eating pasta. I love pasta. Uh, but according to my doctor, that's very bad for me. So guess what happens? I have to pay uh, for, for pasta? Well, I just teach two more classes. <laughs> but when my wife talked to the doctor, and the doctor says, Roberto needs to stop eating pasta, guess what? There's no pasta at home. It's a quantity restriction. Yeah, she's a Republican, by the way. <laughs> so, but it's, it, is, it is actually important to understand that the negative impact of all trade, what we have to do is to pay attention to the form of the intervention. I think they want to do something to make it visible to the constituency that voted for Trump. But if that is, in the end, a 10% tariff with, with uh, Mexico and a 10% tariff with China, 
We will survive that easily. In fact, be glad. Be glad that is. If we stop training with a country, like more or less what happens every Saturday Night Live when Alan Bol Alec Baldwin is there, <laughs> that, that, that quantity restrictions are the ones that are very costly. Um, I think that that's, uh, again, a lot of what I'm seeing is, um, is that there's a lot of rhetoric, and I think a lot of rhetoric will spill over in some actions. But if, ESO, if those actions are trade on 10%, uh, uh, revise of Obamacare, uh, but without repeal. Again, repeal is a, is a, is a quantity restriction. There are people that mm -hmm. had access that I am denying access now. You see, that, that, right. is, that, that is costly. But if this is a revision of Obamacare, they can revise it two million. In fact, it's good that we revise it. It was not perfectly designed. So I think it's good that we revisit financial regulation. It was not perfectly designed. I think it's great that we revise healthcare regulation. It was not perfectly designed. So if we're on the revision mode, revise everything. Uh, I am always concerned, and in fact, pay attention to those, quantity restrictions. And in fact, the environment is one mm -hmm. that we try to protect the environment with quantity restrictions. We do not want a pipeline. You see? So, right. so when we free that constraint, then it's not about a carbon tax. The carbon tax will not ameliorate the cost of the pipeline. So you see here is a relaxation of uh, quantity restrictions. Those are the ones that have significant impact on, 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 on the economy and everyday life. In the world of Twitter, I, I forgot to say that, in the world of Twitter, the biggest risk is headline risk. And if in the financial sector, I think they must be tired of headline risk. Every time, I mean, it just happened with uh, Nordstrom, no? There's a tweet for Nostrum, goes up by 10%, goes up by 20%. That uncertainty is not fundamental uncertainty. It's an uncertainty that bothers our life. Uh, that will be here for a while, because I don't think he will stop tweeting, by the way. I don't either. No. No, I think that is here to stay. That's here to stay. Yes. Yeah, so it does appear, though, from just the last 24 hours and the conversation that he had with the president of, of China that Tillerson has a certainly some sort of voice of reason. It does look like things are somewhat calming down in the State Department, that there, there are some logical recommendations coming through. Um, and it's, it'll just be, it'll be interesting to see you know, how it continues to play out. If it's, I, I think in general he's clearly agitated and doesn't, doesn't, did not recognize or understand fully what the complexity of our of our government and the institutions and how they work, um, it, and it, and that you know he is not in a castle. I I I, I, I agree, and in fact I serve under a president that was exactly the same. <laughs> uh, the difference is that here uh, the institutions will protect us. The freedom of speech will protect us. I hope so. Yes, I mean, it, we exactly. do have uh, another Supreme Court seat that is potentially will become available. And that is when, I mean, I never thought that in our, in my lifetime, I would see our government operating basically at the heels of the judicial system. I mean, that's kind of what many of us are holding on hope for. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I did not think that that would really come, come to pass. But, but yes, to your point, it's, it's extraordinary that it exists and it's, it was set up this way for a reason. Yeah so that we would have a balance. W welcome to populism. Well, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, and it's, uh, um, I do remember serving under that president that um, uh, there's something that Mark Twain said, and it could not be more uh, correct at that, that moment, that common sense is the least common of all senses. Right. And I don't think that, um, that, that presidents necessarily learn. I, I, I think uh, presidents, uh, in general, what they do is that they are somehow affected by the people that surround them. And, 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 and their views and their ideology is very, very difficult to change. They are usually very passionate in general. Right. And, and I expect that to be the case here. And in the same way, I expected the, that to be the, the case. The only thing is, is that it's not, it hasn't ever been clear what he really believes or stands for. So I yeah. don't necessarily feel 
I'm not convinced that he has a strong, any strong convictions, um, which is dangerous and um, also encouraging in some respects. I, I don't believe that he came into this with, he had these, these big grandiose things, but I don't know that, that because you don't understand how they work, <laughs> and you really have barely participated or been committed yep. to any of these things, then your impact on them is going to be somewhat somewhat limited. So I do not think he has, that he really believes in anything. I think he really has a list that he keeps of the things that, his headlines that he wants to achieve. To achieve yes. Yeah. Yeah, and, 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 and I think hopefully the people that he's advising finds the least, um, the least damaging way to deliver those promises. That, that's, yeah, I agree. And, it's, uh, and it, it's so, so, yeah, uh, and so our institutions hopefully will do something about that and, uh, and, and hopefully we will be able to. You know, education it. comes up constantly as being you know, one of the missing links in all of this because we clearly have this divided nation. Um, and a lot of people have pointed to, well, it's the school system hasn't, isn't, doing, isn't doing enough. And you're, when you look back on the experiences and you look at other countries and the populism that you talk about, do you see where, because the, that I don't, I don't know like how we necessarily address that here. Um, Especially because yeah. the, you're talking about it's a socioeconomic issue yeah. as well. Um, a populist, both from the left or the right, uh, they they do not want to invest in education. I, I would say that 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 has been true throughout you know history, and uh, and the reason is it's much easier to govern through fear and ignorance than through reason. And, um, and, and therefore, um, yeah. However, uh, to, to be honest, the education system in the United States, we have tried to change them uh, many times for the last 60 years, completely unsuccessfully and with good intentions. So there's no, I mean, the California education system is impossible to improve or deteriorate for that matter. <laughs> so it, just, it will be unchanged. So, mm -hmm. uh, so in that sense, but, but I do think the U.S. needs to invest way more on education. Uh, we put one third uh, of our citizens through college. I think this is unacceptable. Uh, when I look at developed nations, yeah, they put two thirds of their people through college, and I have no idea what it is. Uh, well, that's it clearly is not so my perplexing. salary; they don't pay me that much. Uh, so, but but college is expensive, but we have to find a way to finance that, and um, and we and I think we have to do this through the private sector. I think that we we need the private sector to commit. That could be a cost where you actually not only put your time, effort, but your resources. Uh, where you find ways to improve education system at the primary school, at the preschool system, at the secondary school, and then we find a way uh, to, to improve it. Um, but there will be no, no, well, from no an major online initiative. Standpoint, I mean, if you've got more cellular um, access than ever before in this country. I mean, there is a huge hole there. That's, I mean, you have more children and communities who can access the rest of the world through right in their classrooms. Um, and it still continues to be this gaping, this gaping hole, unfortunately. I mean, I think that the people in this room can feel empowered that there's a huge opportunity there. Um, and they're all fit to fill it. Yeah, in fact, I have. Uh, it's a great place to wrap up this discussion. Um, <laughs> opportunity. And before, opportunity. Before we get back into how sad we are. <laughs> no, 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 no. I hope, I hope that we have been fair about saying things are difficult, but they are not impossible. Exactly. And, and in fact, let, let me just finish with this. I have known many of you for many, many years. And uh, I have been teaching here in this institution for 20. And there is something that I know is that you have never, ever, ever failed me. Never. When there's a problem out there, you solve it. When there's an opportunity there, you improve it. When there's, a, when there's an issue there that needs your attention, you get committed. And I'm pretty sure, I know this guy will miss my class, so he will probably disappoint me a little bit in the next 10 seconds, but, uh, but I can tell you, you have never disappointed me. So my hope, this country, my hope is not because this country necessarily has institutions, that's one, it's because you exist, you put all your time and your commitment, I have absolutely no doubt 
that we will actually survive this path. So thank you so much. Thank you.